Oh, pardon moi. I guess it was a little backed up there. Speaking of backed up, hey, I had a backup page. I have a backup page on TikTok. Right up. That was a really good segue. Also, learn to speak. Uh, yeah, so I uh, appear... I don't know why I'm all of a sudden from the Midwest. Okay, sure, you know, I had stories I told. Where am I going with this? I don't... Let's just... <sighs> anyway. Crime. It happens. Apparently it happened a lot on Halloween. Uh, I had a whole playlist of more Halloween cases on my backup page, my scarier page. Must have posted several videos during, you know, multiple bands, blah, 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 from my main page. Uh, so here's like a slew of Halloween cases, but also a couple additional cases that I found in random playlists. Uh, and then a couple other just random spooky videos. This is just a smorgasbordish borgish. It's a crimeish borg. No, no, Mike, it's not. But anyway, just Mike, just, just turn off. If only it were that simple. What am I doing? This is so awkward. I always make this incredibly uncomfortable. Anyway, just get to the video, Mike. All right. Just here, fine. Enjoy 20 something more stories and stuff. Fart knockers, geek burgers, jerk wads. Viewer discretion is advised. I love you all so dearly. One of these people would vanish from a Halloween party in 2014. Would they ever be found? Hello, true crimers. This is another deadly Halloween. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured behind me was 22-year-old Chelsea Bruck from Monroe, Michigan. On the night of October 25th, 2014, which would then lead into the morning of October 26, 2014, Chelsea would attend a humongous Halloween party, and she would go dressed as Poison Ivy. They say there was upwards of a thousand people at this party. It was a wild night, and by all accounts, she was having a great time. There wasn't any drama. She was there with friends. According to witness testimony, sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning, Chelsea would be seen leaving the party with an unidentified male. This is the composite drawing that they came up with. And after that, Chelsea would never be seen alive again. By October 28th, a couple of days later, when Chelsea still hadn't made her presence known, her family became extremely concerned, and they would officially file a missing persons report. Police would begin questioning everyone from the party, or at least everyone they could get. They scoured videos and photos from the party, trying to see exactly where Chelsea was at all times that they could track her, just to see if they could figure out who this unknown man was that she left with. And yes, this photo is from that exact night. The family, friends, the police, they all begin a massive search, but they find nothing for months. And then on April 5th, 2015, they would find the exact Poison Ivy costume that Chelsea was wearing that night thrown into some industrial site off the road. There were traces of male DNA on the costume. And then on April 24th, 2015, buried in a shallow grave near a construction site, they would find the remains of Chelsea Brock. It took six months to find her. It wouldn't be until 2016 when they would finally get a DNA hit from the bodily fluid that was left on the Poison Ivy costume. And it matched a man by the name of Daniel Allen Clay. The day after he was arrested, he would confess to the murder. He claims that they were having consensual sex. He claims that she asked him to choke her, which he admits he did for about 30 seconds, and then she stopped breathing, and he couldn't revive her. Interesting, because her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Gee, Dan, how did that happen? Well, a jury convicted him of first-degree murder. He said he was extremely sorry and that he fucked up. Mm. He was sentenced to life without parole. On Halloween night 2012, a woman would be murdered and dumped in this field. And her killer never should have even been free to do so. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case 
of John White. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, where the fudge do we even start? So in 1980, when John was 22 years old, he was living in Battle Creek, Michigan. One day, he would invite a 17-year-old girl named Teresa Etherton into his basement. He said he wanted her to see a racetrack he set up. And then, for some reason, he stabbed her 15 times. And then he choked her. He said to her, and I quote, You're going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but what the fuck? You're just a woman. Teresa survived. John White was arrested. He would be convicted, but then he won an appeal, stating that his attorney didn't allow him to argue insanity. So the courts released him. Good job. In July of 1994, in Comstock Township, Michigan, 26-year-old Vicki Sue Wall disappeared. John White had a brief affair with her. Surveillance footage showed that she was taken from a grocery store parking lot by a bearded man at 3 a.m. Six weeks later, her body was found. John was questioned, arrested, but because there was no physical evidence, he would plead no contest. He got an 8 to 15 year jail sentence. He was released in 2007. He once told a prison therapist that he fantasized about having intercourse with dead bodies. Now we're in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, 2012. John met a woman named Sally Gay. Don't be stupid about her name in the comments. They even got engaged to be married. This is Sally, by the way. By the way, John, yeah, he became a pastor at Christ Community Fellowship Church. It's where he met Sally. Sally had a few daughters, one of them being Rebecca Gay. He would later state he fantasized about having intercourse with her dead body. Well, on October 31st, 2012, he would go to Rebecca's trailer in the same neighborhood he lived. He would then strike her repeatedly with a rubber mallet. He then put a zip tie around her neck and tightened it, strangled her until she died. By the way, her three-year-old son, he was in the next room. He allegedly had intercourse with her corpse and then dumped her like garbage in this field. In 2013, he was convicted and was sentenced to 56 years in prison. He was 55 at the time. Oh, he turned into a pumpkin Santa Claus. And on August 28th, 2013, he took his own life in his prison cell. Oh no. On a Halloween night in Quebec, Canada, a man would unleash a random attack. Hello, true crimers. It's time for another deadly Halloween. And this is the case of the Quebec City Stabbing. At approximately 10.30 p.m., as the Halloween festivities were winding down, a 24-year-old man would be walking down the streets of Quebec City. This would be specifically near the Parliament Building. He was dressed in costume with some sort of medieval garb, but unfortunately the sword in his hand, unlike this man's, was very real. In fact, his sword was described as a katana-style saber. Well, he chose people at random and started to stab them. The first victim, a 56-year-old man by the name of Francois Duchesne, well, he was snuck up on and had his throat slit, and he would die instantly. The authorities were called in virtually right as the man started to do this. He would then continue to chase down random people. He managed to stab and injure at least five people, but then he would also manage to kill one more person. The second fatal victim was a 61-year-old woman. Her name was Suzanne Claremont. Now, all of this happened relatively quickly, and the police were eventually able to surround the suspect, and they would finally capture him. The man would be quickly identified. It was a 24-year-old man from Montreal, and his name was Carl Gerard. The police were able to determine he intended to kill a lot more people. He even had gasoline canisters in his vehicle, suggesting that he was planning to start fires as well. Now, this is a scenario where it's kind of good that COVID was around, because this was just last Halloween, October 31st, 2020. And in Quebec, they had pretty strict lockdown procedures. And for Halloween weekend, 
it was a lockdown weekend, so the streets were not highly populated, and there were virtually no tourists. Or else, this could have been significantly worse. They said his motive was personal. Apparently, he had threatened to do something similar, and he told a therapist this five years prior. But I'm not sure why this wasn't addressed then. I, I don't know. On June 18th, 2021, the prosecutor for this case filed a direct indictment, which means that this case would go directly to trial without any kind of preliminary hearing. That trial has not happened yet. Worst Deaths Imaginable Backup Page Edition. Hello, true crimers. Viewer discretion is advised, and also this is another elevator story, so if you are easily triggered by elevator things, you may not want to watch this. This was Jose Sandoval Opazo, and he was originally from Italy. He was an electrician aboard the Carnival Cruise Ecstasy. And on December 27, 2015, while the Ecstasy was about 27 nautical miles from Grand Bahama Island, on its last leg of a three-day cruise, he was working on top of an elevator. This is not him, of course. This is just to show you what it would look like. The elevator in this instance was stopped on the sixth floor. He allegedly had the elevator door propped open with a screwdriver, and an investigation would find out that he had also disabled a safety feature on the elevator, something that apparently is common with electricians who are working in elevators. When all of a sudden, the elevator began to move. It was now moving from the sixth floor up to the ninth floor. The movement of the elevator, they believe, startled him and he fell backwards and he fell down the side of the elevator. There is very little room between the wall of the elevator shaft and the elevator itself. Almost no room. So, Jose, uh... Oof. He would be compressed between the wall of the elevator and the wall of the elevator shaft. Between the extremely narrow walls of the elevator. His body was crushed and, from what I understand, dragged up the elevator shaft. Oh, Jesus Christ. Well, how did, how did people find out? Um, let me tell you. Because the elevator was now moving, people were able to board the elevator. And um, a passenger who was waiting outside said he heard what sounded like a rushing waterfall. And this is when people were noticing a literal waterfall of blood rushing down the front of the elevator doors. It, it was like, if you've seen the movie The Shining, that's the visual I had. There's no telling for sure how long it took for him to die, but by the sounds of it, it was relatively quickly. At least that's what I could hope. Apparently, there were people who took photos and video of the blood not knowing what it was beforehand and posted it online. I haven't seen it, but the way that the blood was pouring would indicate there wasn't much of him left. The death was ruled an accident. Carnival Cruise was not held liable because it wasn't their fault. I knew I hated elevators for a reason. On a Halloween night, a baby would be stolen from her home and it would only get worse from there. Hello, true crimers. It is time for another deadly Halloween. Viewer discretion is advised. This little angel here was a 19 month old baby named Nima Louise Parker. And she lived, of course, with her parents in Lawton, Oklahoma. On Halloween night in 1977, Nima was in her crib, which this is her actual crib here. Now, she had been crying a lot that night. Her parents were trying to do the, you know, let her cry it out and kind of fall asleep thing. I know a lot of parents do that. Totally normal. Eventually, the crying stopped and Nima's parents went to bed. The next morning, Nima's mother, Rose, went to check on her, and she wasn't in her crib. She asked her husband, George, have you seen Nima? He said no. They searched the entire home. Nima was gone. Immediately, the police were brought in. It was treated as a child abduction. George worked under the suspicion that somebody was already in her nursery when everyone went to bed. The nursery window was locked, the front door was locked. It is very possible that her kidnapper was hiding in the closet. They searched and searched and searched for her. 
And sadly, on the day before Thanksgiving, a horrible discovery was made. A group of children were messing around in an abandoned house. They opened up this refrigerator and little Nima was inside, dead. The autopsy would show that she died from asphyxiation. She suffocated. The family obviously was devastated. The Carters would tell authorities that about two months prior to this murder, someone would mysteriously poison their dog. And then a few days after that, someone vandalized their home. Could that person who did those things be connected to this? Well, that person was never found. In fact, the only suspect they had was a woman named Jackie Robido. This was a 17-year-old babysitter who did babysit Nima. Oof. I don't know why, but twins always freak me out. Jackie was accused of murdering one of these twins. These were the Carpenter twins. And before the Nima story, these two girls would also go missing. Jackie babysat them. They would both be found in a refrigerator. One of them died. Now, Nima's father doesn't actually think Jackie did this, even though it's clear she did kill one of the Carpenter twins. But she had access to the house, to the baby. Captain Blurryface here, Jackie, she was convicted of killing one of the twins. She would die in prison. And Nima has still not gotten justice. After a Halloween party, a young girl would go missing, and days later, she would be found dead. Hello, True Crimers. This is another episode of Deadly Halloween, and it is the case of Shauna Howe. Viewer discretion is advised. Shauna was an 11-year-old girl from Oil City, Pennsylvania, and she was a member of the Girl Scouts. On the night of October 27th, 1992, Shauna would leave a Girl Scouts Halloween party. Her parents were expecting her back a little after 8 p.m. because that's when the party was ending. And the party was relatively close to her house, so she was walking home. Shauna never got home. Her parents, obviously filled with worry, they would call the police and she was immediately reported missing. A witness would come forward that on that night, a little after 8 p.m., at the corner of West 1st Street and Reed Street, they would see a man who resembled this man, Eldred Ted Walker. The witness said that this man approached Shauna, and then the witness heard screaming and then saw a car skid away. The police were familiar with Eldred, so they picked him up, they questioned him, and then he, of course, denied all of it. On October 29th, 1992, just a couple of days later, they would find a piece of Shauna's costume, which was a gymnastic costume. They found it in a wooded area and it was kind of near a railroad track, but at the time there was no sign of Shauna herself. That would change the next day. About 200 yards away from where they found Shauna's costume, they would then find the body of Shauna. The autopsy would show something pretty horrific. She was sexually assaulted. The clothing she did have on had traces of male DNA. Her mouth also had traces of male DNA. Where she was found was under like a trestle or a bridge. They determined that she was alive before she hit the ground. So her abductors had their way with this little girl threw her over a bridge while she was still alive, and then she would die of blunt force trauma because she landed on a very dry, very hard surface with rocks. There was trauma to her head and to her chest. But the investigation went cold, and it stayed cold for about 10 years. In 2002, they finally got a DNA hit. Andy Richter? No! Oh no, that's not him. It matched a man by the name of James O'Brien. He was already in prison for attempting to kidnap someone else. He was never a suspect in the Shauna Howe case. Well, Eldred came back into the picture. He would confess, yep, he did kidnap the girl. But it was these two brothers, James and Tim O'Brien, who actually killed her. He got 40 years. They got life without parole. Ugh, this is a terrifying composite drawing. And it's of an unknown man believed to have murdered a young girl. Hello, True Crimerers. It's time for another episode of Babysitter Murders, and this is the case of Kelly Cook. Viewer discretion is advised. This story takes us to a little village in Alberta, Canada, and we are going back to April 22nd, 1981. 
And Kelly Cook was a 15-year-old girl who dabbled in babysitting. At approximately 8.20 in the morning on that day in April, the Cook residence would get a phone call. A man identified himself as Bill Christensen was on the other end, stating that he would like to inquire about the babysitting services of Kelly Cook. This man had actually tried calling another babysitter first, but they had to decline. And that babysitter is who recommended Kelly Cook. That's why a lot of people refer to this case as the backup babysitter. At 8.30 p.m. that same night, a man driving a full-sized North American car, I don't know what that means, they pulled up to the Cook residence. Kelly gave her parents some love, and Kelly's mom said, please call us when you get there. Kelly agreed. She walked out the door, got in the car, closed the door, and that was the last time anyone would ever see Kelly alive again. Kelly never called her mother. And unfortunately, they never got the address of where he was supposed to be taking her to babysit. There never was a house. There never was a babysitting job. The RCMP would believe that this was a premeditated, planned attack. They think this person planned this over the course of a month, possibly two months. The initial babysitter was likely the preferred victim, but this Bill Christensen settled for Kelly Cook. They searched and searched for her, but nothing. She just poofed into thin air. That is until June 28th, 1981. Floating in the Chin Lake Reservoir in Alberta, Canada, would be the body of 15-year-old Kelly Cook. She was bound with rope, weighed down with cinder blocks. She was fully clothed, no sign of sexual assault, and she was very badly decomposed. She had to be identified through dental records. This was a composite drawing of Bill Christensen. This was made from some people who worked at a gas station who believe they saw this man. But then the RCMP, they would later on take this photo off of their official website. Why doesn't he have eyes? I just, I don't like that. And that's it. Her murder is unsolved and they have virtually nothing to go on. Who killed Kelly Cook? Worst deaths imaginable, backup page edition number two. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, true crimers. I will be continuing to use this page until at least August 14th when I'm allowed to post on my main page again. This was 26-year-old James Thim from Beatrice, Nebraska. He was a member of the Yahweh cult in Rulo, Nebraska, which was, oh Jesus, children of the corn vibes over here. The cult was led by Michael Ryan and their base of operations was this farmhouse that was owned by a man named Rick Stice. This was a small chapter of the Yahweh cult. It had roughly 20 to 25 members. Well, Michael Ryan here says he was told by God to murder James Thim, who had recently been demoted in the cult to the slave title. Well, you know, murder him by torturing him. And you know, what better activity is there to bond with your son? So he got the help of his teenage son, Dennis Ryan. This is where I remind you again, viewer discretion is advised. This is a very triggering thing. You see, the owner of the farm, Rick Stice, was also recently demoted to a slave. Uh, Fim was told to uh, sexually assault Rick Stice. Oh, and then Rick Stice was told to do the same thing to his own five-year-old son, Luke. And they forced Luke to return the act. Five-year-old Luke would end up being killed by Michael Ryan when he pushed him too many times into a desk. Thim was strung up by chains in a shed. They kicked him repeatedly, bullwhipped him, and this stuff went on for days, by the way. Michael Ryan, uh, well, he forced James to bend over a crate and he shoved a shovel handle up, up, you know. Later, the autopsy report would show that the shovel handle went at least two feet into his body. Michael and his son Dennis would repeatedly sexually assault him to the point where it actually ruptured his uh, rectal area. They then again went back to whipping him, and then Michael Ryan took out a gun and shot his fingertips off. Then they uh, took a razor blade, and while he was still alive, they uh, 
slowly sliced the skin off of his legs. And he screamed in horrible, bloody agony. Michael Ryan then jumped on top of his chest repeatedly until James would die. Him and five-year-old Luke were dumped into unmarked graves. Michael Ryan was sentenced to death for this. He died in 2015 of cancer. And his son, Jebediah over here, he only got 12 years in prison due to a legal technicality. He roams free. On Halloween in 1979, a woman would be murdered and discarded like garbage. And for 40 years, she would only be known as Orange Socks Girl. Hello, true crimers. This is another deadly Halloween. And this is the case of Deborah Louise Jackson. Viewer discretion is advised. Sometime in the early morning hours of October 31st, 1979 in Georgetown, Texas, the body of an unknown woman would be found lying in a culvert. And this was off of Interstate 35, and authorities believe that she was actually thrown over a guardrail and just discarded like trash. These were the initial composite drawings done of her since she had no identity on her, and she was not matching any missing persons known at the time. In the autopsy, they discovered a significant amount of bruising around her neck, so her cause of death was strangulation. She did have bruises all over her body as well, but they believe this is because um, when she was thrown over the overpass and hit the cement, this caused bruising which would be a good indication that she had actually been murdered not too long before she was discovered. So the exact day cause of death, they believe, was the morning of Halloween. They tried to identify her in the initial goings of this investigation, but they were never successful at it. She had also been sexually assaulted, by the way. Now, since they had no identity for her, they would label her as Orange Socks because she was wearing a pair of orange socks, but that was about it. Oh God, it never gets easier. Go. Cool. People Magazine's 1982 Sexiest Man Alive, Henry Lee Lucas, would end up confessing to her murder. However, they had no actual evidence to connect him to that murder. This is the man known as the Confession Killer. He confessed to thousands of murders and sexual assaults. The majority of them were not even true. He, along with his buddy Otis Toole, they just clearly wanted fame. Now, they obviously murdered people, just not as many as they claimed. He claims he picked up orange socks in Oklahoma. And after she turned down his advances, and I don't know why, look at that face. <laughs> he said he pulled a car over, sexually assaulted her, and strangled her to death. And then also sexually assaulted her when she was dead. Now, according to records, Henry Lee Lucas was supposedly in Florida at the time, but orange socks was killed in Texas. That being said, he was convicted for her murder. And then he died in 2001. In 2019, through DNA, Orange Socks finally was identified. Her name was Deborah Jackson, and she was 22 years old, and she disappeared from Abilene, Texas in 1977. So at least her family finally got some closure. Also in 2019, they found DNA on her socks, and it was from two different men, but I don't think they've matched it to anyone yet. On a Halloween night in 1982, hello, all right. An older couple would be terrorized. Yeah, no, I, uh, I see you. Hello, true crimers. This is another deadly Halloween. And this is the case of Marvin Brandland. Oh. This story takes place in Fort Dodge, Iowa, with Ethel and Marvin Brandland. They had spent their evening handing out candy to trick-or-treaters. They absolutely enjoy doing it. They thought they were done for the night but there would be one more knock on their front door. They went to the door together, opened it, and standing before them was a grown man wearing a pillowcase with just the eyes cut out. And he said, and I quote, trick or treat, give me your money or I'll shoot. Now, Ethel at first thought it was a joke. She thought this was one of her family members trying to play a joke on them. She actually reached for the pillowcase to try lifting it above their face. But the man grabbed the pillowcase and held it down firmly. So she turned around and walked towards the candy dish and the man followed her inside the house. He then pulled out his gun and would point it at the couple. The assailant would order the couple down to the basement to where the safe was. This person 
knew they had a safe in their basement. Now, Marvin and his wife, they were not wealthy people. They did not have a plethora of money. He owned a little company that would like service carpets, I assume for cleaning, but they weren't exactly rolling in it. Marvin was a World War II veteran. Now, at this point, they actually hadn't gotten to the basement yet because they had to go through the kitchen. Marvin, kind of using his World War II background, thought he would try to go for the gun, so he did. This is when the assailant fired the gun and would shoot Marvin through the throat. Apparently, the assailant then ripped off the pillowcase and fled. But Ethel, who would survive this attack, didn't actually see him. Marvin would die shortly after at the hospital. This is Marvin and Ethel's granddaughter. Now, this is her now, but back on that fateful Halloween night, she had actually just left her grandparents' house not but a few minutes before this happened. She even told them, please don't answer the door after 7.30. But they did. She was just saying this, by the way, just out of concern for her elderly grandparents. To this very day, this case is unsolved. The family strongly believes someone in the family did this. Most of them have a specific person, but authorities aren't releasing their name. I guess time will tell. A man just doing his job would die in one of the worst deaths imaginable. Hello, true crimers. This is the story of Ismael Martinez Huertas. Ismael was a sanitation worker for the city of Riverbank, California. He operated a garbage truck that was owned by Gilton Solid Waste Management. The truck he was driving, which is the exact one pictured here, he actually reported several times that there was an issue, specifically with the sensor on the hydraulic arm that would pick up the garbage cans. To give you an idea of how powerful these hydraulic arms actually are, this is an image from a completely unrelated story. The mechanical arm had basically crushed the garbage can, which you can see a fully intact one back there. So they're pretty powerful. On Monday, August 26, 2019, Ismail was doing his normal rounds, and about 3.30 p.m. he was on Homewood Way, which is right here. And by the way, he did all of this himself. He didn't have like anyone driving with him. So the image you're seeing is actually from one of those doorbell cameras. So allegedly it would pick up um, Ismail going to the garbage can because the mechanical arm wasn't working. It was malfunctioning in some way because again, the sensor was having an issue, which even after all his complaints, they never fixed. So the garbage can was picked up, but then it fell inside of the truck itself. So, uh, Ismael would then climb inside and then he would try to retrieve the garbage can. Now, the neighbor who caught this footage said, I saw him go up, but then I never saw him come out. This is because the mechanical arm, well, it malfunctioned again. And this time, it would prove to be a fatal issue. Now, I cannot find the exact details about what exactly happened, but Ismael would be crushed by the mechanical arm. What would happen was the arm, I guess, retracted back and it pinned him. And reminding you of this image, this is something similar from what I understand happened to him. It likely would not have been an instant death, but it is believed he did die rather quickly. No one heard any screams or cries for help, and it wouldn't be until nearly an hour later when people noticed the garbage truck hadn't moved for almost an hour, when people grew concerned and they called police. By 4.26 p.m., Ismail would be declared dead. The only information they ever really released was that he was crushed to death, but his exact cause of death has not been released. But it was due to the malfunctioning arm on the truck. Unfortunately, I cannot find any other updates, like in terms of lawsuits, but it's a bad way to go. This may look like an ordinary blood draw. However, it is anything but ordinary. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of John Schneeberger. Now, John here was originally from South Africa. And after getting his medical degree from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, he would move to Canada, specifically to Saskatchewan. Eventually, he would meet Lisa Dillman, and then they would get married in 1991. 
She already had two kids, but then they would have two kids of their own. Pictured here is a woman named Candace. Um, she would also go by the name Candy. And on the night of October 31st, 1992, oh, I guess this also counts as a Halloween case, she would actually be at Dr. Schneeberger's office. For whatever procedure she was having done, he would sedate her. However, she was not completely knocked out. And what would follow is a moment that she would never, ever forget. You see, not too long after this meeting with John Schneeberger, she would go to police and claim that he sexually assaulted her and did so while the 23-year-old patient was sedated. She was positive that John assaulted her. Now, there was bodily fluid found inside Candace, and this was collected by authorities. So, of course, police obtained a warrant to collect John's DNA. John agreed to give his DNA, and they even recorded the moment he was getting his blood drawn. The results came back. It wasn't him. His DNA was not the DNA that was found inside Candace. But Candace was like, no, 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 he did this. He sexually assaulted me. Please test his blood again. So they did, and he obliged. Once again, the DNA didn't match. So Candace hired her own private detective because she knew what happened. So this detective broke into John Schneeberger's car and obtained samples that would have DNA, his DNA, which when he had tested, it did match the DNA from her sexual assault kit. So the police got another warrant to collect John's DNA. But again, the blood sample they took from John didn't match and the blood sample was just too degraded. John's wife, Lisa, she would find out that John was actually sexually assaulting her 15-year-old daughter from her first marriage. She reported this to the police. Once again, they took his DNA. This time, they took a swab of his mouth, they took blood, and they took hair. Finally, it matched. He did sexually assault Candace. How did he get away with it? He implanted a drain in his arm and filled it with another man's blood. He always managed to convince the phlebotomist to use that specific arm. He got six years. A brutal Halloween murder in London has been unsolved for nearly 58 years. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Catherine Lillian Armstrong. Viewer discretion, it's advised. This is the only picture I can find of her, but Catherine at the time of the story was a 70-year-old woman living on her own, and she lived in Sandyford, which is in Glasgow in the United Kingdom. She had retired in 1957, where she used to be a headmistress, and that was at Denton Road Junior School. She was a practicing Methodist at the Central Methodist Church. Now, on that Halloween night in 1963, she was actually expected at her church. This was because they had a weekly choir practice, which was done every Thursday, but she would never make it. Now, the very next morning, one of Catherine's cousins, whose name was Ada Ridley, she was gonna stop by Catherine's house just to say hello. She got to her house around 10.30 a.m., this is her house right here, and she knocked on the door, but no one answered. So she knocked again, no one answered. She would try one more time a few minutes later, no answer. Ada had also noticed that all of the curtains were closed. This was unusual to her because Catherine was usually up very, very early with her curtains open, so something was wrong. So, concerned, Ada called police. They got there relatively quickly. They forced their way into the house, and right there confronting them at the very bottom of her staircase was the body of Catherine Armstrong. She had a dress on and she was wearing slippers. By all appearances, it looked like she was dressed and ready to go, minus the slippers, uh, for a choir practice that night. She had a nylon stocking wrapped around her neck, and her face was bloodied. Police also noticed she had defense wounds on her hands. Now, no weapon was found, but the wounds initially looked like they were stab wounds. And when the autopsy was done, it appeared she had been stabbed at least 30 times. Police theorized that she was able to make her assailant bleed because there was blood all over the house. But there was no indication that Catherine had been moved anywhere. The house had no forced entry. Nothing was stolen. No fingerprints. No footprints. No shoe prints. And like I said, no murder weapon. No knife was found. 
police questioned over 5,000 residences in the area, but it literally turned up nothing. The only thing they got was that some students had seen her looking out her window around 6.30 p.m. that night. Her choir practice was supposed to be 7.30. Police theorized maybe teenagers did this, possibly ex-students from her school, but sadly, to this very day, Catherine's killer has never been caught. Was it a Halloween prank gone wrong or something more evil? At first glance, you might think you're staring into the faces of two innocent teenage boys, but the reality is you are actually staring at the faces of pure evil. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of the Bever family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. The Bever family was from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and it consisted of nine family members. The dad was named David, the mother was named April, then you had 12-year-old Daniel, 7-year-old Christopher, 5-year-old Victoria, 13-year-old Crystal, 2-year-old Autumn, 18-year-old Robert, and 16-year-old Michael. On July 22nd, 2015, around 11.30 p.m., 12-year-old Daniel Bever would make a panicked phone call to 911. He would say, my brothers, they are attacking us. They are attacking the whole family. They can hear screams in the background and then the phone goes dead. Police would get to the house fairly quickly. They were able to hear some distant kind of whispered cries from inside the house. So the officer just charged in. And what they found was something you should only ever see in a horror movie. But sadly, this was reality. They first saw 13-year-old Crystal Bever. She had multiple stab wounds but she was actually still alive. Upstairs, they found two-year-old Autumn. Thankfully, she was alive and she wasn't even harmed. But sadly, there were five dead bodies in the house. These five right here. Crystal was able to tell police it was our brothers. They did this. Teenagers Robert and Michael Bever. They used knives, hatchets, just anything sharp they can get their hands on to stab brutally their whole family. They would later claim to say, oh, our parents were just super restrictive. They were strict. They homeschooled us. But neighbors would say that specifically these two boys always had some very strange behavior. After massacring their own family, they fled the house. But they would be caught really quickly. This is one of their arrest images. This is the other brother. In a very creepy interrogation, one of the brothers would flat out confess. He pointed them to a flash drive with their plans for the murders. They even found this really disturbing crayon drawing that one of them drew before they murdered their family. I hate when murderers smile. I can't stand it. Ugh. Police would find out they had about 3,000 rounds of ammunition being shipped to the house. They also had plans to continue killing after this. They said they wanted to murder 500 people. They were literally just two insane humans, and they would both get life in prison without the possibility of parole. Being burned alive is arguably one of the worst ways to die. And sadly, that is what happens in today's worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here next to me was 68-year-old Dennis Antiporek. And in January of 2015, he and his wife were living at the Eden Isles condominiums in North Miami Beach, Florida. Around 11 p.m. on a January Sunday in 2015, Dennis would leave a little note um, on the fridge. Simply said, went to sauna. Three hours after he left that note, his daughter, Lara, said, where's dad? He hadn't come home from the sauna and no one knew where he was. So she began searching the condominium, specifically, obviously, with the sauna first. When she got there, the sauna door was closed, so she had to pry it open. And inside, she found something absolutely horrifying. Lying on the floor of the sauna was a man she didn't recognize. It was a man with very dark skin. It couldn't be her father because he had very light skin. Until she noticed his clothing hanging on the wall. And the realization hit her. The man on the floor with very dark skin was, in fact, her father. An ambulance was immediately called, but unfortunately when they got there, they declared him dead. And more gruesome details would very soon emerge. Because of the heat, his body, his skin, it began to peel off. 
In fact, parts of his skin was literally stuck to the ground. The man was completely charred. When the autopsy was concluded, it was determined that he had died of a coronary. They believe this was a heat-induced heart attack. So, what caused this to happen? Aren't saunas supposed to turn off after a certain time? Yes, except this timer was broken. He didn't know that. Don't know if the condominiums knew that either. You see, Dennis used the sauna at these condominiums at least three times a week. He was a regular. He knew exactly how this all worked. Once the timer goes off, essentially the heat portion stops. But this timer didn't stop. It's entirely possible he fell asleep. It happens in saunas. But this man was essentially cooked to death. The coroner also said there had likely been heat-induced dehydration and a possibility of a stroke. All because of the heat. All because the sauna didn't shut off. So this poor man basically roasted to death. The family did file a lawsuit, but I'm having a hell of a time finding the results of that. They did, they sued the condominiums and I believe the people who made the sauna. But again, I don't know the outcome. Rest in peace, Dennis. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Blind River Murders. This was a story featured in a 1993 episode of Unsolved Mysteries, and I remember this one terrifying the living garbage out of me. June 27th, 1991. At a rest stop off a beaten path in Blind River, Ontario, Canada, Gordon McAllister and his wife Jackie were on a road trip in their RV. They had started their trip in Lindsay, Ontario. They had been driving for a while, so they wanted to call it a night. So they pulled off into the rest stop and they noticed that they were the only ones who were there. Rolling over into the next day in the early, early morning hours of 12.55 a.m. on June 28th, Gordon and his wife Jackie were asleep in their RV when all of a sudden someone was pounding at the door. When the couple got up from the noise, they approached the door and the man could be heard screaming, this is the police, you need to move your RV, you cannot park here. When Jackie went to open the door to greet this man, he then pointed two guns at her. He then uttered the phrase, first I'm going to rob you and then I'm going to kill you. He demanded Jackie's jewelry, he demanded the wallets, Jackie's purse, anything of value. After they surrendered their valuables out of nowhere, the man then shoots Jackie and kills her instantly. Gordon manages to jump out of the RV and roll under it, avoiding the gunshots that were going his direction. Shortly after the commotion had ended, a 29-year-old man by the name of Brian Major pulled into the rest stop. This is when he saw the assailant, and Gordon can hear Brian say to the man, Do you need help? before he noticed he had two guns in his hands. Brian put his car into reverse and tried to flee, but it didn't work. The assailant fired shots into the car, killing Brian instantly. Gordon would survive the ordeal. He would give a description of the man, and this is a utterly terrifying computerized composite drawing of the assailant, who to this very day in 2021 has still never been caught or identified. In 1999, uh, police would investigate Ronald West, another murderer who was actually at that point serving time for committing two other murders. At the time of the murders, he lived 12 miles away. He owned the types of guns that were used. He even used to be a police officer. The Blind River Killer identified himself as a cop. He even owned a blue van, which the Blind River Killer reportedly drove, but no physical evidence connects him. Gordon died in 2014, and this case is still unsolved. Dressed as the dead for Halloween night would become far too much of a reality for one Canadian citizen. Hello, true crimers. This is another deadly Halloween. Viewer discretion is advised. This was 18-year-old Taylor Van Deest from Armstrong, British Columbia in Canada. On Halloween night 2011, she and her friends were really excited to go trick-or-treating for the last time before they became too old to do it. She would be dressed as a zombie that night. 
I think in 2011, zombies were a very popular costume idea. So she would leave her house in the early evening hours, and as she was leaving, she was constantly in contact with her friends through text. The walk to her friend's house would take her down some railroad tracks. It was secluded. It was dark. The last text message that she had sent to one of her friends was that she was being creeped. And then they never heard from her again. It was only 10 minutes into Taylor's walk when the text messages suddenly stopped. And when she didn't show up to her friend's house, the concern grew. Her family was alerted, and so she was presumed missing. So a massive search began, um, especially along the trail she would have been walking. And about two and a half hours into the search, they would find Taylor. She was found alive alongside the train tracks, but she was unconscious and she was horribly beaten. She was hanging on by a thread. Unfortunately, several hours later in the morning, she would die in the hospital. Taylor had been strangled and she also had been beaten over the head several times. She never woke up after they found her, so she was never able to identify her attacker. The coroner would report that she definitely fought her attacker. They actually found scratches along her own neck that came from her as she was trying to pull his hands off. She also got her attacker's DNA under her own nails. There were people who heard screams in that area, but again, it's Halloween night, screams are normal. Someone claimed to have seen a man running from the area and lurking around the area, and they described him looking like this. In April of 2012, they would get a DNA match from the skin cells. It matched a 26-year-old man named Matthew Forrester, who had been in that town that night on Halloween looking for sex. He says he followed Taylor that night down the train tracks until the area was dark enough. He then claimed he was looking for consensual sex from a stranger. When she resisted, he said that she fell over on her own accord and hit her head on a loose pipe. But the evidence of a fight would prove his story wrong. He did also sexually assault her. He was convicted in 2014, but got a new trial due to a jury issue. He then pled guilty to second degree murder and got 17 years to life. Hi! Hello, scarers! Tonight I'm gonna tell you the story of some Halloween home invasions. And messing around in the background will just be some creepy images. Aw, it's Dobby back when he was a thug. In Farmingdale, New York, Halloween night, 2014. At around 8.45 p.m., a 34-year-old woman, she opened her door because someone was knocking. And at the door was three masked men. Two of them were holding handguns. They forced their way in. What the f*** is that? Anyway, they demanded money. They then pistol-whipped the woman and her husband. They then bound their wrists with duct tape ransacked their home, and then escaped. And they were never caught. Story number two. In Helena West, Helena, Arkansas. Halloween night, 2015. Four adult men knocked on the door and said, Trick or treat! And a little old lady opened the door. She immediately had a shotgun put to her face. Her elderly husband was sitting in a chair in the living room half asleep. When then he woke up to guns in his face. He was like, nah, motherfucker. He had a gun himself. Then he fired it into the ceiling. And it scared them all away. They even dropped some of their guns. Nice. Story number three. Halloween night, 2013. Seattle, Washington. Three men wearing Grim Reaper costumes and armed with guns would reveal themselves through the peephole of someone's home. They had guns, of course. But no one got hurt, but a whole bunch of jewelry and a whole bunch of cash was stolen. Oh, oh my god. Halloween night, 2019. Orinda, California. A woman rented out an Airbnb under the false pretense that her asthmatic family members needed to escape the fires that were happening. Instead, she threw a massive Halloween party. On that fateful Halloween night, there were roughly 100 people inside the Airbnb when all of a sudden, gunshots rang out. Everyone in the house began to run and scream. Chaos erupted. When the dust settled, five people were murdered. I don't know if it was a party-goer or someone random. 
Warning, the graphic images you are about to see are not of people in actual distress, but instead are people willingly participating in the world's scariest haunted house attraction. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, scarers! This is the haunted house attraction called McKamey Manor, and it was located in Rancho Penasquitas, which is in the San Diego, California area. There are other versions of this house, like in Tennessee, but this is the original version. It was founded by this fellow in the blue shirt, Russ McCamey. He spent- hello. Okay. He spent half a million dollars renovating this home and turned it into a maze and, um, quite honestly, a, uh, a torture tour. So, it's extreme. You actually don't pay money to get in, you pay them four cans of dog food because they also rescue dogs. This is an image of people signing the 40-page waiver as four people in costume pretend to kidnap them. This is one of those haunted houses where the people can touch you. They put duct tape around your mouth, they'll duct tape your arms together, and they will literally simulate an actual kidnapping. Again, this is fake, TikTok. It's as acting, it's not real. Now, Russ basically scripts this whole process. Most of his work is behind the scenes, directing all of this. The people who do this know exactly what they're getting into. This tour can last up to eight hours, but from what I understand, a majority of people couldn't last more than two. But they push you into all sorts of contraptions to scare the living daylights out of you. They have actually bound people, dumped fake blood all over them, and it's still like a maze. You have to go through like this maze around the house while trying to essentially escape these four kidnappers. <laughs> they'll catch you and they'll put you in a freezer full of blood. You're goddamn right I would not do this. My fat ass would have heart failure. Oh, they get up close and personal with you. Aw, they're in love. Stop it. Now, you must be over the age of 21 to participate. You have to get cleared by your doctor first and bring them proof that you are allowed to do this. Oh, hell no. Those are actual snakes. <laughs> oh. There was a situation where one person did have a heart attack doing this. But I need to stress, you know about everything ahead of time. You have to get cleared by your doctor. This attraction with their 40-page waiver is completely protected, as it should be. Again, you volunteer for this madness. They can physically assault you, to a degree. They force you to eat and drink unknown things. And holy shit. Holy titty f And they psychologically torture you too, no shit. I don't know if it's still operating today though, but would you guys do this? Nope. Scarers. Let's start a new series about Halloween mysteries. <coughs> oh, got enough of that shit. Here's a kooky one. On Halloween Day in 1988, a 29-year-old stock market analyst would vanish. His name was David Lawrence Stone, and he was from La Jolla, California. He was really into that new age sh using spirit guides and whatnot. Well, on October 28th, 1988, his zen was apparently depleted. He threw a shindig at his apartment, but then he started getting into a fight with his friend, where David would begin to just punch his friend repeatedly. It was described as a very violent attack, and out of character for David. So David said, I'm gonna go on a walkabout. 
I'll go on a drive about. I ain't gonna go walk around, you crazy ass. He told his friends and his family he'd be back in a couple of days. He just needed to find himself. A couple days later, on Halloween, he would walk into a desert 145 miles east of Tucson, Arizona, where a couple of farmers spotted him, but then he was gone. <laughs> Sorry. Later on, investigators would question that farmer. The farmer said David told him he was out there searching for the beast. Other witnesses who claimed to see him from afar said David was acting very bizarre. He was talking to himself. He was using his arms to gesture at things. But there was no one in front of him or anywhere even near him. Five days later, his vehicle would be found. It was left on the side of a New Mexico highway. And that wasn't the only weird thing. David left clues. A little bit northwest of where his car was, they saw a little pyramid made of rocks with a drawn triangle around it. David was really into this idea of vision quests, and apparently this is symbolic in that. His car was parked next to pyramid-type mountains. They searched a little farther the next day, and they found another pile of rocks. Three miles north of that, they found written in the sand a string of numbers, which they would discover is the Fibonacci sequence, a sequence that stock market analysts use a lot. The sequence is supposed to end in 21, but his ended in 18. His car was parked next to mile marker 18. Investigators thought this was a clue or some sort of distress message. They then found David's Rolex watch next to two quarters. David was never found alive. His skeletal remains were found two years later. No known cause of death.